Welcome to Relationships as Spiritual Practice, Bridging the Secular and Spiritual, with your host, Lachelle Lowe Chardet, founder of Mindful Compassionate Dialogue and Wiseheart PDX. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. Hmm. Feeling gratitude for your practice and your willingness and your dedication to making the world a better place, starting with your own life, transformation, family, and community. Thank you. Today I would like to enter into this realm of power with and life-serving boundaries with regard to your family. Hmm. Sometimes I say practicing the skills you learn and living your values can be most difficult in your family, like the graduate school of spiritual practice. And at the same time, of course, often living the most deeply in our heart that we are able to live our values in our families whether it's your family of origin or the family that you're creating now in your life. So today I specifically want to focus on examples of power with that we might expect to see in a family. And then I would like to name three areas in which we could imagine that power with is translating into life-serving boundaries. In previous podcasts, I've talked more deeply about power dynamics, power over, power under, and power with, and defined those terms. And I've also, in episode 13, talked about life-serving boundaries. So today we won't go deeply into those definitions because you can find that in other podcasts. Okay, let's dive in. Examples of power with in a family. Mm, They could be very many examples. And today I'm just going to focus on four. And they're not in any particular order. I'm going to start with differences. In a power with consciousness, differences in ideas, opinions, strategies, requests, preferences are not received as a threat. And so differences are easily accepted, supported, and celebrated. So, for example, in a power with consciousness within a family, if the family highly, the parents value athletics and they're athletic and maybe the first two kids are just naturally also athletic and excited about doing sports and the third child does not have that preference, is really interested in hanging out and being quiet and reading books or doing art or less physical activity, then that child is celebrated and embraced. Just as an example of celebrating difference. Another power with symptom that you would see in a family operating with this consciousness would be negotiation of agreements as a valued and prioritized activity that an opportunity to negotiate agreements would be received as oh yes let's do this this is something we do this is fun this is important this is more important than getting to an end goal right? Achieving something or getting out the door. And so as such, activities are planned to make space for negotiation. 
And rather than be re being received as a burden, like, oh, we have to talk about how this is going to go, they're received as a celebration, a chance to connect, honor the differences in the family, collaborate, and move towards synergy and harmony because of those clear agreements and because the time was taken. And so under that area of agreements, we understand rules actually as collaborative agreements that are set up to meet needs. For me, I don't want to get tied down in how we use words. On the other hand, I want to recognize that some words have a lot of baggage. <laughs> the word rules might have a lot of baggage might be so conditioned with wrong and right and power over and power under and punishment and reward that it might be worth throwing out that word rules it might be more supportive to use words like collaborative agreements or family agreements so using that word, family agreements, family agreements then have the qualities of transparency. Everybody knows what the agreements are. They have the quality of specific and doable. Everybody knows what it looks like, sounds like, the how, who, what, how often, how long, where of the agreements. Everyone is clear on that. They're, we're in a shared reality about that. So there's an explicit, those qualities make it explicit. And also there's an understanding that agreements are constantly evolving and changing relative to the needs of a life that is constantly changing and relative, if there's children in the family, relative to the developmental capacities of the children. And of course, to the capacities and competencies of the adults. Okay, so the first two symptoms of power with are that differences are accepted and supported and celebrated, and negotiation is a welcome and prioritized activity, negotiation of agreements. The second two are about repair and responsibilities. Repair, relationship repair, as I'm talking about it, defining it, means that we're willing to acknowledge the impact of our behavior on others, especially when it stimulates disconnect or unmet needs for someone else or pain. And so we can't help we constantly have an impact on each other, right? And we constantly affect each other. Hopefully there's a high percentage of the effect on others being an, a supportive effect. And inevitably, it's not always that way. So accepting that and not seeing that as a failure or something outside of what's expected, then in a family system that has power with, we would expect to be repair, for repair to be a regular activity as well, not dependent upon one's role. We would expect someone very young, someone very old, someone with more responsibility, someone with less responsibility, to initiate repair when they notice the impact of their behavior on someone else. And that repair probably takes a lot of forms. If repair is regular, a regular activity in the family, a prioritized activity, then the more regular it is, the less mm, intensity that exists with it because that repair builds emotional security. And so a repair can be a simple moment of eye contact and a face that mirrors the pain that was stimulated for someone with our actions. That might be repair. 
Repair might be a genuine I'm sorry for what I did. I didn't intend these results. Repair could be a longer process. We teach a longer process in mindful, compassionate dialogue that involves many steps. And so it also might include that long process of managing reactivity, offering empathy for the impact, being transparent about the need you were trying to meet when you engaged in a way that didn't work for others, and then coming, ending with agreements about what to do differently in a future similar situation to take care of the needs at hand. And the last one I'll name as an example of power with consciousness in a family is that responsibilities are well defined for each person, right? This is maybe a sub-point of agreements, but I, I perceive that it's so important that we want to pull it out. Responsibilities are well-defined for each person in the family. They're in alignment with the strengths and weaknesses of each person, their actual capacity, developmental levels. And there's something that people embrace, that they enjoy, because they understand a responsibility not as a job or an obligation or a burden, but there's an understanding that these responsibilities help us move as a unit. They help us collaborate and create the environment that we want to share and live in. They help us create a community that we enjoy, a family that we enjoy. And so when responsibilities are well-defined and in alignment with the values of the family, then what we don't see are sudden explosions about why someone didn't do something, or guilt trips, right, or hidden expectations that show up with anger or shaming, that kind of thing. When responsibilities aren't fulfilled, instead they're met with curiosity. Oh, I'm remembering that you said you wanted to be responsible for taking the garbage out, and I'm noticing the garbage truck went by and our garbage wasn't out. Can you help me understand what happened? Because I'm really valuing uh, efficiency in our family of taking care of each other and taking care of our home, And I'm wanting it to work well for everyone. Would you be willing to help me understand what happened with not having the garbage out and ready on time this week? Something like that. So four examples of power with in a family system. Differences are accepted and celebrated. Negotiation of agreements is a valued and frequent activity that receives priority. Repair is done frequently, regardless of the role someone occupies in a family, and responsibilities are well-defined and given as a gift. Okay, let's look at how power with consciousness then might translate into life-serving boundaries within a family system. And again, of course, there are are infinite examples of this and today we're just going to look at three particular examples or possibilities of how power with might manifest in life-serving boundaries and those three are the parent role i want to talk a little bit about that And then making a key distinction, how needs are held and how boundaries operate around an understanding of needs, also relative to power dynamics. And then explicit negotiation of needs. Okay, let's start with parent role. So... When the parent role is clear and operating from life-serving boundaries, here are some things I might expect to see. I might expect to see or know 
that the parent has done and is doing their own healing work, their own skill building and transformation, so that they are not passing on tragic strategies of their own childhood to the next generation. They're taking responsibility for reactivity and healing work that's necessary that necessary for them to be able to, as best they possibly can, behave and make decisions and live from their values, from what's important and what's supportive. Also, really important is that the parent is doing the best they can to meet their personal needs with other adults and not using their children to meet their needs. Obviously, in a parent-child relationship, children meet the needs of parents. Hopefully, that's a natural and joyous mm, occurrence. And at the same time, If a parent depends on a child as an emotional counselor, as a reflection of their own worth and therefore makes sure that child upholds the family image, or as a source of empathy, a primary source of empathy, or they attempt to meet their attachment needs with the child such that they are pulling in the child for that intimacy and companionship and mm, validation. All of that is a recipe for a lot of pain and confusion and is not an example of life-serving boundaries that we would hope a parent would uphold. So when a parent is upholding life-serving boundaries, they're doing the best they can to meet their personal needs with other adults so they can show up for their children resourced and attentive. We're dreaming here the big dream, right? We're dreaming the big dream. Ideally, a parent is also upholding life-serving boundaries because they know where to direct their attention with regard to caring for their children. So we talked a lot about that in a couple of other podcasts, Directing Attention and Life-Serving Boundaries. So for now, I'll say that perhaps a key of being able to set life-serving boundaries for the kids, helping the kids set that and helping themselves, is that there's a foundational understanding of child development that answers the question at each stage of that child's life what are their primary physical needs to develop a confident relationship primary psychological needs and spiritual needs and they're using this as a guide understanding the importance that particular needs are key at particular stages of life And that's helping them direct their attention and set boundaries about what that child is exposed to, what the family does or doesn't do, what they ask of their child, what they do for their child. Okay, and the last one I want to name, which has generated a lot of pain and confusion in circles of nonviolent communication where people are practicing, Because in nonviolent communication, as you know, as you likely know, and also in mindful, compassionate dialogue, we have a feelings and needs list. And we really rely on that feelings and needs list as a way to connect with other humans because we all have the same basic set of feelings and needs, needs constantly arising and disappearing in a given moment. And we learn to express those within nonviolent communication and mindful, compassionate dialogue. Marshall Rosenberg, the founder of nonviolent communication, used to say when he was alive that to share a feeling and need without your request about how you'd like that met 
is an act of emotional terrorism. Because without that action at the end of that sentence or at the end of that expression, you're not letting other people know how they could help you or how you're helping them yourself. And therefore, you're just throwing stuff out there hoping someone will help you. And so with parenting then, mm, so important to model the expression of feelings and needs. That's how you're transmitting emotional intelligence to your children. And so, so, so important that when you express a feeling and need to your child or in front of your child, that you're immediately naming how you're taking responsibility for that need. And if you don't know in the moment a specific request of you're making of another adult, or if it's a very simple thing of your child, if that matches a developmental level and collaboration that's possible, then you can say, I'm noticing that's what's true for me with what I need, what I feel, and I don't yet know what action I want to take to help myself with that. So give me a moment to think about it. You can always put a placeholder, but that still names that self-responsibility. So, so important. Okay. The second is to make some key distinctions about needs and how that fits with life-serving boundaries. So in a power with system, we're honoring equally the needs of every member of the family. And of course, we're having this big dream that our whole planet is a power with system and that we're honoring the needs of every living being. When we see an example of power under in a family system, we often see a boundaryless family in which somebody's needs is more important than the others and people are scrambling to make that person happy or make everyone else happy. Could be in the whole system, right? That it's the need that's alive in the moment that's most important, right? That there's a I want to say maybe a reactivity or an impulsiveness that if someone's unhappy and has an a desire or impulse, we try to make them happy. Perhaps there's a fear of unhappiness, disappointment, or discomfort. Often with power under consciousness, there is that fear. And so we see there, sometimes we use tragic terms like, oh, that child is a spoiled brat, or that child runs that family, or that person, as the case may be. And, and so there's a letting go of boundaries. There's a willingness to make decisions that cost the needs of other people in order to placate someone else. So life-serving boundaries sees an impulse or a desire or a temper tantrum or disappointment and says, ah, you're feeling really disappointed because you really have a need for play and you really had the idea to play this way at this time with this toy, right? As far as a child or with an adult. I'm noticing that when I say no to your request, I see you look down, I see your shoulders, shoulders slump. I'm guessing you're disappointed because you really care about and then fill in the blank with the need. And then, then a negotiation would hopefully ensue if it was possible, if reactivity wasn't running the dialogue, in which you would say, I wonder if we can look for another strategy so that your need can be met in a way you would enjoy. Power with is, again, like we said earlier, entering into that negotiation. And then 
power over is more that situation we see in which a family system system has chosen one person's needs as more important than anyone else's. And that can happen in a lot of ways. It can happen relative to hierarchy based on that culture, right, that values the father the most or values the mother the most or values the smallest child the most, whatever that culture is valuing centrally and that slides into one person's needs being valued more than another's. Or it might occur if one member of the family is chronically ill, right? And the family might organize around the needs of that person and lose track of the needs of other members of the family. Other children might fade into the background, siblings, so on. There's lots of ways that might happen. So... In a power with system, when there's someone, for example, let's use this example of someone who's chronically ill. In the power with system, someone who's chronically ill, then that the, those parents or the people with the most responsibility would look for extra support for the family. And that's why we're meant to live in villages, right? And we have the support right there in the village of extended family and neighbors. We're not handling something as difficult as chronic illness by ourselves. Regardless, then hopefully that person with a greater responsibility for attending to the needs of family is looking for external support so that attention can go to the needs of all. And the last key distinction, I'm going to return to negotiation of needs, which is similar to what we talked about earlier, negotiation of agreements. But I want to name a few more things here. That when we're negotiating how to meet everyone's needs in the system, we're, you would often see this cultivation of emotional security. And that would often look like empathy, recognition for each person's feelings, needs, requests, preferences, sensitivities, and so on. Mm. So if you have family members who are gluten intolerant, let's say, then you would see that willingness to enter into negotiation about how we handle food, just as a simple example. And you would see those life-serving boundaries around maybe what food is in the house or what restaurants you go to, things like this. So those needs and negotiations of needs would inform life-serving boundaries. Also, the family would understand that some boundaries are meant to really protect needs. And so they're less flexible. They're less open for negotiation. Some boundaries are set based on the neighborhood you live in, based on the ca developmental capacity of each member or the competencies of each member, right? So, for example, mm, if you have a child who is incredibly athletic and competent, and may, let's just say you have a twin of that child who struggles to move their body in a way that's safe, then you're going to have a different set of boundaries regarding riding bikes or scooters or whatever it is for each one of those twins because... The seven-year-old twin who doesn't have the athletic capacity could do the same activity and get seriously injured versus the other twin. And so you understand that those boundaries are set to protect certain needs relative to that situation. In nonviolent communication, Marshall had a concept he called protective use of force. Protective use of force means that 
when there's no capacity or accessibility around negotiating a strategy to meet needs, your two-year-old is running into the street, you pick, you force the situation by picking the two-year-old up and preventing them physically from moving into the street. So that's a particular kind of boundary that's also important. And it's also a consciousness piece, right? Because you can pick that two-year-old up with force from, I'm the boss and I'm telling you not to go into the street. Or you can pick that two-year-old up with the physical force needed to do that and say, it's my job to keep you safe and so I'm going to keep you from going into the street. It's a needs-based decision around safety in that case. Life-serving boundaries are more flexible and the strategies to meet needs are more flexible whenever they can be. And then again, that's that willingness to enter into negotiation. And we recognize in when we have that competency of needs-based negotiation, we recognize that the variables of what, when, who, how long, or how often are the ones we're looking at to see which variable can move most easily. Yeah? And that helps us with our negotiation. Okay. So we're coming to the end here, and I'm just going to review for you the key points, and then we'll close. So we started with examples of power with that you might see in a family that operates from a power with consciousness. And we named four four things that we might look for. Differences are accepted and supported and celebrated. (coughs) Negotiation of agreements is valued and prioritized. Repair is done frequently and regardless of role. Responsibilities are well defined. And then we talked about three aspects of a power with family system and how we might see life serving boundaries play out. And the first was that the parent role is very clear. The second was that we're making key distinctions about how needs are taken care of re- relative to power under power over and power with. And the last was that we are explicitly negotiating needs. Thank you so much for being with me today. I'm imagining that as you're listening, the ripples of your practice and your efforts to live from your heart, to live from a consciousness of connection, are going out and out and out. Thank you so much. Radiating love from my heart to yours. You can learn more about Mindful Compassionate Dialogue and find free resources, live offerings, and self-paced workshops online at www.wiseheartpdx.org. You can also connect with WiseHeart on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, or by emailing info at wiseheartpdx.org.